Welcome to the Everybody Matters podcast, a show dedicated to the idea that when organizations care enough to show their people that who they are and what they do matter, they unlock the only business idea with truly unlimited potential. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. Don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at Barry Waymiller, on Facebook and LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. Barry Waymiller CEO Bob Chapman was once told by someone from a major health organization that the person you report to at work can be more important to your health than your family doctor. It makes sense considering you see your leader at work almost daily and you see your primary care physician far less often. But it's about more than just the sheer time spent at work. It's about the direct effect our work and our work environment has on our health. We're not talking about the effects of manual labor. We're talking about stress. Our guest on the podcast today is Jeffrey Pfeffer, an author of several books on company culture and a professor at Stanford. Recently, he said this in an op-ed through the BBC. Quote, The aptly named American Institute of Stress claims that workplace stress costs the American economy some $300 billion each year. A paper I co-authored in a leading peer-reviewed journal estimated that there were 120,000 extra deaths annually in the U.S. from harmful management practices, and that extra health care costs were $190 billion each year. That would make the workplace the fifth leading cause of death, worse than kidney disease or Alzheimer's. In the U.K., the health and safety executive reported that 12.5 million working days were lost from work-related stress, depression, or anxiety in 2016 to 2017, end quote. Jeffrey has a new book, Dying for a Paycheck, where he basically contends that the workplace is killing us and nobody cares. Barry Waymiller's Director of Communications, Mary Ryder, and I talked to Jeffrey about all of this on this week's Everybody Matters podcast, and we begin by asking him where he got the idea for studying this issue and for his book. It came from my sitting on the Stanford Committee for Faculty and Staff Human Resources, which is basically the Stanford Committee on Health Insurance, and also uh, some years ago on the Hewitt Human Capital Leadership Council, which is basically Hewitt's, some of their largest clients. And I noticed in both in both committees, people seem to be, uh, employers seem to be reasonably enough obsessed with health care costs, and I use the word obsessed intentionally. Um, there is a health care cost crisis around the globe, as everybody knows, um, and it occurred to me um, as I listened to the discussion that, uh, that while there was a lot of discussion about the organization of health care and hospital management, and there was certainly a lot of a focus on what you could get to individuals to take more responsibility for their health, that it struck me just intuitively that there was a, a big piece missing, which was, you know, people spend a lot of their day at work, and there was no consideration of the effect of the work environment on people's health and their health-related behaviors. So when an opportunity came for me to participate in a conference, um, I asked the conference organizer, my friend Nuria Chinchia in, at ESA in Barcelona Business School, um, if I could do something not on work and family, which was the main focus of the conference, but on health. And then I you know, began reading the epidemiological literature and found that there was an enormous amount of evidence on this issue. And then... Um, and then proceeded to uh, to get more involved and and more frankly upset about what I was learning that you know that uh, that the workplace I mean you know as your CEO is fond of saying you know the Mayo according to Mayo Clinic uh, the person you report to at work is more important for your health than the family your family doctor which is certainly true and his thing where he, which I quote him in the book in which he says you know I stood up in front of a thousand CEOs in San Antonio and told them they are the cause of the healthcare crisis. Because most health most healthcare costs comes from chronic disease, which is correct. That's what the World Economic Forum data will show you. Uh, chronic disease comes from the behaviors and stress that's created in the workplace, and uh, and so therefore the employers really are responsible for not only the healthcare uh, 
cause crisis, but for a lot of death and suffering. So that's kind of how this all happened. So let's kind of take a step back. You know, what what is the natural knee jerk reaction of a company when they're looking at rising health care costs? What's their natural inclination to either um, blame it on or and to try to fix the problem? Well, the natural inclination is to blame it on the unhealthy behaviors of the human beings who are working for them, uh, not quite understanding the extent to which those uh, health-relevant behaviors um, are coming from, uh, the, the, in part, from the work environment. And their natural inclination is, of course, to do what most organizations have done, which is shift costs in a variety of different ways to the employees. Um, and so then the Kaiser Family Foundation data on this is absolutely clear. Over the years, a fewer, low, smaller percentage of employers even offer health insurance, and those that do have shifted costs, either through shifting premiums or co-payments or deductibles or some combination of the three. So there's been a lot of cost shifting. Yeah. As you've presented this material, you've clearly written a book, and I think you've done, uh, you've done peer-reviewed papers on this before as well, before you even started the book. As you presented this research, your research, what has been the reaction from the business community over this? <coughs> well, to be honest, I think the reaction from the business community is to ignore it. They are hoping that nobody's going to pick this up and that the problem will somehow go away. That is often, by the way, as you guys know, the reaction to the business community to many problems. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And not, and not only this, and not only in this domain, I mean, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, business leaders hope that, you know, if they ignore it, it'll disappear. Well, what do you, what's the first step? What do you want I them to the first do? Step, I think the first step is to, is to, uh, is to kind of get the word out to make, as Bob, of course, as Bob Chapman, of course, has also been trying to do, to make it clear that uh, that this is a a serious and substantial issue, which has you know the workplace is according to our estimates the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, um, and unlike the other leading causes of death in the United States, completely preventable, not a hundred percent, but 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 you we could cut the toll dramatically. You don't have to do some exotic you know medical research or you know pray for some breakthrough as we would with Alzheimer's or kidney disease. I mean, this is really, this is really a preventable cause of death and we ought to be preventing it. Um, and so I think we need to, yeah, I think we need to bring this to people's attention um, as I'm trying to do, as Bob is trying to do, as a, a bunch of other people are trying to do and, uh, and, and, and then try to convince either companies or the government or human beings uh, to, to form some kinds of social movements or, you know, nonprofit organizations, something to, to, to bring pressure to bear uh, so that uh, things will change. Mm -hmm. Tell us some about some of the, the more startling things you discovered during your research. The most startling thing I discovered is that as bad as the problem is, it's actually, as bad as the problem I thought was, it's worse. Um, you know, I think the, and I think the most startling thing I discovered, I, so I gave a talk on this, the Human Resource Institute in New Zealand last fall, and I said, you know, I said, I have two pieces of information for you. Number one, the workplace is killing people. That's bad. I'm me, the second piece of information I think is worse. As near as I could determine, no one cares. I mean, not no one. Bob Chapman cares. You know, I mean, there are obviously a few CEOs and other people who care. But in general, there is remarkably little caring about this. And that has been a part of the response of the book that I find interesting. So people say, well, you know, this is it. Stress is part of work. This is it. You know, work cultures are the way they are. This is it. Work is a four-letter word for a reason, etc. So there is a sense of resignation, um, even on the part of governments, not just the U.S. government. We won't even begin to discuss that. <laughs> but, uh, but even on the part of governments that are actually paying for these bills, um, there has been a, a just a, 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 an amazing passivity towards addressing this issue. Do you think that that is because they don't want to accept liability or <clears throat> maybe because they can't wrap their head around that line of thinking or because, because to me, it seems like there's, you know, with a cause and effect, 
if you're the cause and that's the effect and the, and the effect is high cost and all this kind of stuff, you'd want to address the cause. But do you think that there's like a, they can't wrap their heads around the concept or don't accept the liability or, or what is it there? I, you know, I think they believe that human beings are, so my friend Nuria Chinchia has this line, which I love in the book. It's one of my favorite lines. She says, why do we care more about polar bears than human beings? And um, because with respect to the physical environment, there is not that level of passivity. Governments have refused to let companies externalize their costs of, you know, polluting the air, water, and ground, and the companies are responsible for that, and companies have taken responsibility for being environmentally sustainable. Now, if you're environmentally sustainable, why shouldn't you be human sustainable? Human sustainable, as I tell people, you know, you're worried about, you know, your carbon offsets and all this other stuff. You ought to worry about the carbon life forms that work work for you, which are called human beings. But I, so I have no idea why people are issuing responsibility for this. But I think one thing that I've heard people say to me is, well, you know, if people don't like what they are, they can go somewhere else. If people are getting made ill by the workplace, and nobody, by the way, denies the data or the, or the effect of work environments on people's stress and stress levels and health outcomes, you know, but people, they'll say, well, you know, if, they, if people can't hack it, they go somewhere else. And so there's a sense of agency with respect to people that you don't get with respect to trees or polar bears. So there, nobody expects a tree to move. Nobody expects a polar bear to necessarily, you know, make a profound change in how it lives. Uh, but human beings are, are thought, you know, to have this agency. And so therefore, you know, if they're, if they're suffering, they need to do something about it themselves. And, and in the book, this is what you essentially term social pollution. That, it is social pollution. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is. How high do health care costs have to get? Number one, you know, where are we talking about? If we're talking about the U.S., I, I can do a lot of things to cut my health care costs without ever solving the fundamental underlying causal problem at all. I, can, I don't have to offer health insurance. I don't have, or if to the extent I do offer health insurance, I can, re, I can redesign the health plans in ways that shift an uh, ever larger fraction of costs. Uh, to uh, to employees, and in fact, I can insulate myself uh, as an employer from any increase in healthcare costs because basically, what I can say to my insurance administrator is, you know, every time the cost goes up, we're going to redesign the plan to pass all of this to deductibles, co-payments, or premium um, uh, to the uh, to the employees. So, in that sense, they can avoid the costs if they're in the United States completely. So, in, in that sense, so that's number one. Number two, uh, you know, having now participated in a couple of marketing events with Collective Health, and by the way, you know, I think, you know, Collective Health is an amazing health administrator. Uh, they're relatively small, uh, but they are offering now, they're going nationwide, and they're fabulous. And unlike every other health administrator, who, by the way, have net promoter scores that are either in single digits or negative, uh, their net promoter scores are in the 70s. Um, and so that's a whole other that's a whole other story. But, you know, you, you look at... Uh, you know, I've done these events with, with, with Collective Health, and one of the things I've learned, which isn't going to surprise either of you, is that benefits is contained. So you've got somebody, you've got a head of HR in these organizations, and the head of HR has delegated benefits to somebody whose job is benefits. And so there is a very segmented, microscopic view of this problem. So if... You know, you know this from working at Barry Way Miller. You know this from the quote of Bob Chapman, the person you report to at work is more important for your health than your family doctor. Mm -hmm. The person you report to at work, not your benefits administrator, not, you know, not the head of HR. Right. So, the, so we're talking about changing work culture. And, and you've got a benefits administrator, uh, and, you know, they're, and they're smart, they're lovely human beings, but they do not have the leverage to change the culture of work. This has to happen from senior management levels, as you know. But they are perplexed by the how, and that is what we find all the time. Most people, most, most leaders inherently believe they, uh, that they want to do good by their people, but they just don't know how to do it. It takes a huge amount of uh, courage and patience and money, really, 
to change and that I, Yeah, I would challenge you on that. It actually doesn't take a lot of money. Uh, you know, you can you can put in a. I think you know I have chapter six in this book, which uh, dying for a paycheck, which talks about the two elements of a healthy workplace. One is social support, basically building a sense of community in the organization where people care for each other. That doesn't cost very much, uh, or if anything. And secondly, to giving people more autonomy on the job, that doesn't cost very much either. And in fact, research on job autonomy going back decades shows that when you give people more control over their work, what they do and how they do it, you, you treat them like the adult human beings that they are, um, their engagement goes up, their motivation goes up. So I don't think this is expensive at all. So they read your book, what should they do the next day? What's the first thing they should do? Well, I actually tell you, I can answer that question easily. We know from Management 101, or maybe even Management 1, and from the quality movement, that if you want to change something, the first thing you have to do is measure it. And so I would think you, you have to you have to implement measures, measures of measures of health, measures of health outcomes. Um, you know, it's interesting. I sit on the Stanford Committee for Faculty and Staff Human Resources. We get our health plan administrators. There are four of them because we offer four different major health plans to come in. You know, and they of course talk about costs and utilization and changes in this and changes in that. And everybody at the end of their presentation, everybody looks at me because they know the question I'm going to ask them. And the question I'm going to ask them is, I said, you know, you've given us 20, 30, 40 minute presentation. During the entire 20, 30, 40 minute presentation, you have not talked about one measure of health, or health status, or health outcomes. Health and health benefits and the workplace needs to be about health. As, you know, to repeat again the quote of your CEO, Bob Chapman, who I love, you know, this, 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 is, this, is, this is about health. This is about health and well-being. This isn't just about money. This isn't just about, you know, all these technical measures of utilization and plan design and all this other stuff. So we need to measure health and health outcomes, which is actually quite straightforward to do. So if the way we're working isn't working, is this sustainable? Um, it, yes, <laughs> it apparently is. Um, you know, I have a friend, uh, may, you know, there are many books about trust in organizations, and many people say that trust is essential for organizational functioning, and my response is it clearly is not, because if you look at the Edelman Trust Index or the Edelman Trust Barometer, there is all-time record lows this year in trust in leaders, uh, particularly business leaders around the world, and organizations seem to be working. So not necessarily well, not necessarily efficiently. Gallup will tell you employee engagement worldwide is at 15%, but, you know, it, it, it seems to be sustainable. I wouldn't have thought it was sustainable, but it seems to be sustainable. So if this keeps going on generation after generation, what will it take for people to not accept this anymore? And, and I don't know. I, you know, I mean, so I'm talking to some lawyers, <laughs> you know, and, you know, one of them says this could be bigger than the tobacco litigation, but my friend of mine, who's a law professor at Stanford, who, by the way, has read the book and loves it, says she does not believe the courts in the U.S. at least are going to intervene to do anything about this. Who knows? I, I really, at this moment, you know, I don't know what it will take. I think it will take a social movement. I think it will take exactly what it took for the environmental movement. You, you and I have both already discussed the parallels in terms of social pollution versus environmental pollution, human sustainability, and environmental sustainability. And what, what did it take to change uh, our, you know, interactions and, you know, whatever with respect to the physical environment? It took, number one, decades, and number two, it took a persistent, consistent you know, mobilization of human beings who said enough is enough, that we, we, we really do not want to uh, pollute the world. And by the way, in case you haven't been reading the news, there's a little backsliding on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you met any people along the way that have shared their stories or specific situations? Tons, tons. And I get, by the way, once the book has come out, I got an email this morning. So, you know, I mean, I get emails, you know, every, I get basically now emails every day. Um, so, you know, and the, and the emails are, you know, the emails are in some cases detailed and in many cases 
unhappy. So, you know, here is a thing. I won't name you the name. A thousand thank yous, Dr. Pfeffer, for your work on the book, Dying for a Paycheck. I work for a major cruise line. As of May 7th, I have been on medical leave. The extreme working conditions drove me over the edge, so to speak. Thank you for validating my thoughts, feelings, and suspicions with this book. And, you know, so yes, I get emails like that all the time. The, the, the workplace, we have way too many toxic workplaces, and people are being psychologically and physically damaged. And it's, you know, I just think it's unconscionable, but it is what it is. No, it shouldn't. That's that. It's not what it is. I mean, we're trying, you know, as you see, people like Bob Chapman and the team at Barry Waymiller are really trying to change that. And we, we you know, are, are with you in the cause. Um, but it's taking a lot of voices, really loud voices to try and shake things up a bit. But um, and, and there's signs of it, I think. I mean, I used you hear more and more about organizations trying to change, um, but nowhere near what it needs to be. And you see backsliding. You know, you see a lot of backsliding. So, you know, um, John Mackey of Whole Foods, the wonderful conscious capitalism movement, Whole Foods with the sense of the Declaration of Interdependence from its founding, the idea that, you know, the, the, there's not a conflict, that these are interdependent parts of the system, that employees matter. Uh, Whole Foods, during the first recession, uh, not the first, but the 2008 recession, laid off fewer people than Stanford University. Um, you know, it's a, you know, a very, very good benign organization. And then came the hedge funds. And, th- and now he's bought by Amazon. And John Mackey, the founder of Conscious Capitalism, stood up in front of an employee meeting, this is reported in the media, and says, you know, I think we, um, I think we were too, too good to our um, uh, team members or associates or employees, whatever he called them in that particular setting. And, then, and he's now responsible for taking $300 million of costs out of that business. And you can know where they're going to come from. You know, and my friend George Zimmer ran the Men's Warehouse, fabulous organization, you know, thrown out by the board, um, which got enormous amounts of media attention. And he said it took me 40 years to build a culture and the new team about six months to destroy it. Mm-hmm. So one, one thing that you, you talk about in the book, which we haven't actually got into yet, is kind of the other side of the coin. We've been talking a lot about um, business leadership. But why do people stay in toxic workplaces? If this is so unhealthy for people, why do people perpetuate this and, and keep this sustainable uh, when it's clearly harmful to them? Um, so, number one, as you both know, finding a job is a job in and of itself. So in order to have the energy to find a job and the you know, kind of the intellectual and physical resources to do that, you have to be basically healthy. And so one person said to me, you know, she said, I could hardly, you know, I could hardly remember what I told you 10 minutes ago, the idea that I could have the energy to go look for a new job and hit the ground and hit the ball out of the park on, you know, on the first day of that job is just, you know, whatever. So I think, number one, you know, people are oftentimes so psychologically and physically damaged that they do not have the energy, the, uh, the, the emotional, the physical resources to go out and look for a job. So that's, I think, number one. Number two, organizations play on people's egos. You know, aren't you good enough? You know, if you're really tough, you put up with this. Um, you know, you'd, you'd figure out a way to make it work. Aren't you a real GE leader? You know, Amazon is doing special things. If you were really any good, you know, if we're only for special people, aren't you good enough? So that's sort of, it plays on people's egos, which works, I think, um, very effectively, uh, particularly to, you know, highly talented people. And, uh, and the third is, you know, I've had people say to me, what makes me think that I can have a normal life that has you know, an uh, ability for me to see my kids and ability to, you know, have good sleep and take care of myself when all of my friends are not having this. What makes me think I'm so different and so special? So we have come in the United States of America and in actually in workplaces all over the world to normalize the unacceptable. The unacceptable has become the norm. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you there. You see it everywhere. Um... You know, and, so, and so if you see it everywhere, you know, as you know, then the next question is, you know, if you see it everywhere, what makes you think you're going to do better? 
And by the way, if you see it everywhere, this becomes, I mean, normal has within it the word norm. Norm means what everybody's doing. If every workplace, not every workplace, because Barry Wingmiller doesn't do this, and Collective Health doesn't do this, and you know, Patagonia certainly doesn't do this, etc. But, you know, if most workplaces are like this, then this becomes what is accepted and what is expected. So as we uh, as we kind of uh, wrap things up here, let's let's try to end with a little hope. (laughs) (laughs) What are some bright lights that you see out there? What are some you know, it's 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 a tough this is a tough thing and it's gonna like you said, it's gonna take a huge movement, it's gonna take a lot of work to get these things turned around. But what are the lights of hope that you see out there? Well, I think the lights of hope are that there are companies uh, DeVita, the kidney dialysis company, being yet another one. I mean, there are obviously organizations uh, that uh, take seriously the idea, which I know Bob Chapman believes completely, which is, you know, when, when, when a human being comes to work for Barry Way Miller or Patagonia or anything else, or any other workplace, that human being has entrusted their psychological and physical well-being. To the, to, 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 the, to the organization and the people they're working for, and the organizations ought to take that stewardship responsibility seriously. Some do, not enough, but the some do gives you hope that maybe more will get the message. Um, I think there are the cost pressures, and also, by the way, the performance pressures. I mean, it should not be surprising to anybody listening to this podcast that stressed employees are more likely to quit. Turnover is expensive. It should not surprise anybody Again, listening to this podcast, the the, the data that I report in Dying for a Paycheck, look, sick people are not as productive as people who are healthy. I mean, you know, so, so, so we have created a situation in which organizations are losing as well, and maybe they will come to their senses. So I'm still waiting. If you'd like to find out more about Jeffrey Pfeffer and his book, Dying for a Paycheck, go to jeffreypfeffer.com. That's J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-P-F-E-F-F-E-R.com. Or you can find him on Twitter, at Jeffrey Pfeffer. If you'd like to find out more about Bob Chapman and Ross Zodia's book, Everybody Matters, The Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family, go to everybodymattersbook.com. For updates on the book, this podcast, for a lot of great content and insight, don't forget to connect with us on the web at barrywaymiller.com, on Twitter at barrywaymiller, Facebook, LinkedIn, and check out our blog, trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening. And don't forget, Everybody Matters is the only business idea with truly unlimited potential. <laughs>